everyone and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2017. Apologies have been received today from Margaret Mitchell. Agenda item one is the decision on taking business in private. Um, our committee agreed to take agenda item three, which is the consideration of our future work programme in private. Agreed. Are we agreed? agreed? Thank you for that. Our next agenda item is an evidence session on the progress of the two independent investigations into Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. Yeah. And can I welcome Chief Superintendent Alan Spears from Police Scotland, John Foley, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Authority, Craig Sutty, General Secretary, the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, and Drew Livingston, the Service Conditions Officer from um, Unison. And can I thank those who have provided the committee with written evidence, Police Scotland, the SPS, Unison and the SPF. Thank you for that. And can I refer members to Paper 1, which is a note by the clerk, and Paper 2 which is a private paper. And we're going to go straight into questions today. Um, can I start by asking um, Chief Superintendent um, Spears if you could perhaps elaborate on the restructuring of the Professional Standards Department. What does this mean in practical terms um, in relation to complaint or misconduct? Thank you, Convener. I came into post about 15 months ago. And that, for me, was a period of um, progressional change within the Professional Standards Department. Long-standing has been a perception that professional standards is very punitive in nature. And my approach is to look at an open, transparent and more efficient approach to how we deal with um, complaints. And, in fact, all professional standards matters and look towards organisational learning. So, to help that, it was about creating a national structure, again, we operated um, with a number of regional offices where it was le legacy approaches and perhaps a lack of consistency. So we now have a functional operating model where we have one strand which would be complaints, one strand which would look at conduct, another strand which would look at corruption, and that's supported by some policy units. One of the key elements for me has been about how do we resolve matters at the earliest and swiftest opportunity, and that has helped by the introduction of a gateway and national assessment unit, and that's about really early assessment of any information that's, that's brought into professional standards and looking at what is the most appropriate way to address those matters, if that is um, passing it back to the local policing division, if it's something that can be handled within PSD, it may be a matter which can be handled within, um, by way of explanation, or in fact, in some instances, it is maybe a much more serious matter, and it's something which our anti-corruption unit would look at. Also sitting underneath that, we have introduced a complaint resolution unit, which deals with about 55% of all the complaints we receive in Police Scotland. So, on an average basis, that's somewhere in the region of about six to six and a half thousand complaints. That resolution unit is to engage very early with members of the public and look to resolve those complaints. And we do resolve around 50 to 60 per cent of those complaints very quickly for members of the public. That, that's a very helpful um, background. Before I bring in the other witnesses, do you think then um, that the new arrangements are, are sufficient to um, address the deficiencies that have been identified? There has been some quite critical um, comments made about the way things have been handled in the past. So are the new arrangements sufficient to deal with all of that? I think we're on a journey of change and, and perhaps a journey of persuasion to dispel mm -hmm. some of the some of the perceptions that does exist. Um, one of the opportunities a national model presents is that in every instance I can look at very specifically who is investigating the matter. And quite frequently we now there may be a, a a matter in the west of Scotland, which we would then investigate from the north of Scotland or in the east of Scotland from the west. And really important for me is to bring a high level of independence to those inquiries. So that's something that, that we've been able to do. I think it will take a little bit of time, but I'm hopeful that some of our colleagues and indeed our staff associations are seeing the benefits of the changes that were made and recognise that we are looking to resolve matters as early as we possibly can. OK, that's helpful. Um, can I come to Mr um, Livingston, because Unison had sp specific concerns, and m my colleague Liam um, MacArthur will be, uh, be asking quite detailed questions about, about Unison <coughs> um, later, but, but from a Unison point of view, ha ha has the change answered some of the concerns that your organisation raised? Uh, yes. I mean, previously we went from a position where we didn't really have um, particularly good engagement around some of the working activities that CCU were undertaking, and that went 
that included policy development for one. I think now we're in a far better place in terms of the level of engagement that takes place um, over how ACU and PSD have been restructured, but also the suite of procedures and policies uh, that we now have dialogue over. Um, in terms of whether now we believe that there is sufficient um, integrity around that process, clearly we raised issues about how um, grievances and complaints are, are dealt with internally. And, and our perception is that there isn't a truly independent body that can actually scrutinise these where they relate to employment matters as opposed to c criminal. OK, that's helpful. As I say, we may explore that a bit further um, later. Mr Sutty, I'd be interested in your view on, on this. We are fully supportive of the change of the changes taking place. I think there's been a lot of confusion over over the over the piece as to as to what we're talking about. And actually a lot of the discussion has been about corruption. And actually corruption is a very small part of the work that professional standards do. I think the anti corruption unit are now far better placed to deal with that insidious crime as as it as it takes place. But over and above that, there are three things that uh, that Mr Spear said. One was about um, was about learning. And the other one was about swift resolution. That's absolutely been at the centre of what we've been pushing for. The matters must be resolved early. It's so frustrating to open newspapers and read headlines about instances that have happened years ago. And actually, that must impact on public competence and it impacts on the competence of officers who are serving. I think the assessment unit that's been set up has been a really... Um, bold and, and, and brave move and, and I actually think that we, we need to take some risk in this, this area but I also agree that we're, it's a journey of change and the culture of the whole organisation needs to change. I've seen a significant change in that culture under um, the Deputy Designate Ian Livingston and Chief Inspector Spears in, in how they've actually led professional standards. So I see significant change. It'll never satisfy everybody in the very nature of the work that they carry out. There'll be people who feel aggrieved. But I think whether we'll ever trust, and I saw the Federation response about a, an untrusted organisation, I'm not sure trust is the right word, but I think if the, if the um, PSD and anti corruption units stand up to the values of the Police Scotland, respect, integrity, fairness, they'll, they'll go some distance to start bringing people. Along. Okay, that's helpful. Mr Foley, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, yes, uh, if you don't mind, Convener. Um, we take uh, these matters very seriously, and uh, we took on board uh, the comments that were made uh, by Drew's uh, colleagues in unison uh, in relation to uh, process and procedure, etc. And so it was actually the SPA uh, who requested that HMICS carry out the review. And you're right to say that there was a number of significant issues there, 39 in total. Uh, and as far as I'm aware at the moment, 35 of those uh, have been discharged with four uh, remaining that are in uh, the process. But in addition to that, uh, we also set up uh, a CCU uh, steering group, which was chaired uh, by a member of the police authority. Uh, and that group uh, was there to uh, work collaboratively with uh, Police Scotland colleagues, um, but also to scrutinise the output and the processes that were being uh, implemented. And uh, on that group, we also had representation from the staff associations and the trade unions and other external stakeholders. So the output from that is, is what Alan uh, has put in place and is putting in place at the moment. So uh, we are supportive of that. However, we know that we must continue uh, to monitor it as we move through. So we have introduced uh, some additional processes. So for example, if someone was concerned um, and wanted to raise uh, a complaint or a matter in relation to a member of the anti-corruption unit, uh, every uh, referral that goes in uh, to Police Scotland in relation to that is automatically notified to the SPA. Uh, the SPA uh, would then uh, dip sample in relation to those um, probably three or four times a year, depending on volume. To date, there's, there have been six received, but they're not yet at the stage of us uh, being able to dip sample. We have to leave uh, matters for three months because there is a, a period in there where um, people who are complaining can take uh, what they consider to be an unsatisfactory outcome to the park, and so it would be inappropriate for us to intervene prior to that. Uh, so those pr processes are, are in place. Uh, we will continue to review them. Uh, the policing committee uh, that's recently been set up within the authority will take a keen interest in this. So there will be regular reports there. Uh, there will be regular reports to the audit committee uh, in terms of uh, how it's performing uh, and in terms of stats as we move through to measure uh, and monitor. And of course, uh, anything of significance will be uh, discussed at the full board.
Okay, thank you. That's helpful. John. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, and uh, I think Mr Sutty made a very valid point there where he said it must be clear what we're talking about. Uh, for the avoidance of doubt, um, the agenda item is in independent investigation into Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. So I um, take the assurance from what Chief Superintendent Spears says about openness and transparency, and that's what we all want to see. But that's what I would like to, to speak about just now. And um, welcome, Mr Spears. I know the other participants haven't been here before, and, and, and it's good to have you here. I wonder if the, the, the committee should read anything into the fact that hitherto it's always been a chief officer rank that's come to address these issues, but it's not on this occasion. I think not, Mr Finney. I think the reality is that I'm working very closely with, with the force executive and take a lead in terms of the external inquiries, which are currently ongoing. And I would, I would probably suggest that I'm probably the subject um, expert in, in relation to those inquiries at this time and the developments that we've made within professional standards. Okay, thank you. That, that's reassuring. I, I, I think, again, for the record, it would be helpful to, to put on the position that, that we're in here. So, in relation to the, uh, the IPT, the Investigative Powers Tribunal, this related to six complaints, um, um, uh, two from um, former police officers, their spouses, and two from serving officers, and the complaint related to collateral interference with their privacy. Now, the committee's had a, a, an interest in this for some time, and it's to try and understand where we go, because... I don't think anyone would want to think that the committee hadn't been thorough in trying to understand the issues. And it seems to have become complicated uh, um, and it seems to become somewhat protracted. And, and certainly in relation, and the importance of this is because I'm very keen that there's public confidence in the police and the police have recourse to all methods of investigation that are legitimate and proportionate. In respect of this, of course, this was the serious... Um, the, uh, the obtaining of more than 30 days communications data relates to, to one of the, the cases. So in relation to this, I understand, uh, Mr Spears, uh, that there are seven serving officers are the subject of this investigation. Uh, is that the correct figure? Yes. Um, giving you just a little bit of background, so in, in the summer of last year, you'll be aware that um, Chief Constable invited Durham Constabulary to come in and do an inquiry into the complaints made by um, the individual officers and ex-officers that you alluded to. That work was und undertaken on an independent basis by Durham Constabulary and concluded with a final report being received back in our force in May of this year. Contained within that report was some indication that there may be some misconduct matters in relation to um, the officers who were involved in the process. Complaints in Police Scotland and conduct are two separate matters, and the conduct regulations stipulate that those officers who investigate conduct can't have any previous involvement in any complaint handling. So as a consequence of the information contained within the Durham report, um, we undertook to appoint the PSNI to come in and do a conduct investigation. The re reality for us was that the Durham report became the pivotal report on which the PSNI um, conduct investigation was founded and, as you are aware, very quickly led to an inquiry that currently involves seven officers. That inquiry, I am led to believe, having talk, spoken to colleagues in the PSNI, is nearing conclusion uh, and I am hopeful that that matter will be concluded by Christmas. What we have been doing in the background is um, engaging with the complainers and in recent times we have afforded them the opportunity to come in and see and read the Durham report in a redacted format and at the point when the PSNI investigation is concluded it would be Police Scotland's intention to publish a redacted version of, of the Durham report which again I am confident is in the coming weeks. Okay, now, um you and I both know, and, and but perhaps others don't know, there's a difference between misconduct and criminal allegations. Did the Durham inquiry unearth any um, allegations inferring criminality? There was no allegations inferring criminality, and, and the matter was, in fact, referred to Crown Office prior to the Durham inquiry commencing. And uh, through our engagement with Durham, they were fully aware that should there be any inference of criminality during their inquiry, they would pause and report that through Crown Office. That was not the case. Um, so they have provided us with a very detailed and lengthy report, which brings some organisational learning, brings some recommendations, and indeed brought some concerns regarding the conduct of a number of officers. 
and able to say, um, Chief Superintendent Spears, if any of the seven officers are under suspension? There is no officers under suspension. We have taken some protective measures around restrictions, which is something we would do frequently. That's about protecting the individual. It's also about protecting the organisation. But really importantly, it's also about protecting the public. So the officers who are subject to this investigation at this time are subject to a number of duty restrictions. And are you able to say what the nature of their duties is? It, it, it would probably be unfair of me to go into the finer detail because that in itself would probably identify who those officers were. OK, are you able to say, and the terminology I appreciate is constantly changing, but are they connected with the professional standards department, complaints of discipline, counter-corruption, or any any derivatives thereof, these seven people? The, these, these officers previously had, had a, a role within um, the counter-corruption unit. Um, their current roles are, are in a different area of the business. <coughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, in, in relation to um, the report, um, we heard from the Deputy Chief Constable designate that this information would be made available to the committee. And at the time there was discussions, and, and I, I did say um, uh, um, I can't find my exact words at this time, but I did acknowledge that perhaps the report we would get would be redacted, or elements that would be redacted to protect the identity of individuals, or circumstances that would give rise to leading. Um, it's the 12th of May that this report is received. Why has the committee not received this report by now? In really simple terms, because the report was used for the basis of the appointment of the PSNI to conduct a conduct, a misconduct investigation, and that public that document becoming public would, on one hand, prejudice that that investigation. I thought, for the benefit of the officers who are subject of that investigation, it is really important that the PSNI, PSNI are allowed to progress that to to a conclusion, and, and I am confident that conclusion is in the coming weeks. And that report will be made available? The redacted version of that report will be made available. We will, we will receive a report um, from PSNI. I would anticipate that that will relate very specifically to the conduct, but will also so relate specifically to the broader organisational learning. It is my absolute intention to take what will be a Durham report, a PSNI report, and ultimately a Northumbria report and, and, and create a single report that outlines all the organisational learning that, that, that we need to put in place and in fact have put in place. And I am confident that a large proportion of that has been done on the, on the back of the significant work that was undertaken following the HMICS review. Um, I, I found my words, and they, and they were accepting that there are very sensitive areas where you undertake to make available to the committee as much of that information as legitimately can be made available. And the, the response from the Deputy Chief Constable was, I give you an unqualified undertaking, I will do so. Would be able to provide a summary of that then? Just what, what or are you able to tell me now what the nature of these allegations are? Because there is continuing public interest in it. And rightly or wrongly, there's a perception that um, this is dragging on. People are seeking to kick it into the long gas. And we have a, a duty as a committee to discharge our obligations, to understand what this is about and understand that mechanisms are put in place to prevent a repetition. So are you able to talk about the generality of what these seven officers are, are facing? I'm not. I think that would prejudice the PSNI inquiry. It would be incredibly unfair for the officers at this time who are the subject of that inquiry, and particularly when I'm unaware at this point in time as to what the findings of the PSNI investigation are. What I can do is give you an absolute assurance that the redacted document has been prepared produced and is ready for publication at the point in which we receive a report from PSNI. Okay. Two, two final very small questions for me. Can you remind the committee what the Northumberland report relates to, uh, Chief Superintendent? Yes. North Northumbria are a part of the family of forces located next to Durham, as you'll probably be aware. One of the um, actions that we, we passed initially to Northumbria was to conduct a review of complaints made against members of the counter-corruption unit between 2009 and 2016. From a capability perspective, this was a piece of work that Durham passed to Northumbria. So, num so Northumbria are, in effect, doing a complaint handling review of complaints made against members of the counter-corruption unit between 2009 and 2016. That, in effect, relates to about 23 or 24 complaints and 96 allegations. There's just endless questions. <laughs> um, uh, and what stage is that at? And are you able to say the nature of the allegations? Do any of these allegations relate to criminal allegations that are made? That 
it's a range of allegations that were made that I, I couldn't, in, in the time that's available, account for, for the 96 allegations. This is a range of complaints um, made against members of the counter-corruption unit, largely historical in nature and made by officers and ex-officers who were subject of investigation by, by the counter-corruption unit. What I would emphasise is that Northumbria are not in reinvestigating the complaints, but they're conducting a complaint handling review. And I am understood from, from speaking with Northumbria this week, and we've had a, a very close link with them, that we are hopeful that that report also um, is in the final stages of conclusion. People might be surprised, given the sensitivity that the police attach to issues of data uh, and issues of surveillance, that all the allegations from all these complaints would all be considered misconduct, that none of them would have inferred criminality. And again, you'll be familiar by the term, infer criminality is important. Absolutely, and, and I'm, I'm, I would be pretty certain that in some instances, those complaints would, in fact, some of those complaints would have been referred to Crown Office, and I would also be confident that all of those complaints would be would present the individual with the opportunity to refer matters to Perk. And when can we get the reports, Chief Superintendent? Well, I'm hopeful that we'll have I will have that report from Northumbria by Christmas. The indication is it's in the final stages, and we should receive that report by by Christmas. And it would be our intention to. To, to bring that report to you also. A, a, a similar time frame, would it be, because we're now six months on from the report being received, and the very final, final, and what will be redacted from these reports, please? The, redact, the, redacted, the redacted document, it, it will largely be about Durham, and it's, it it's relates to very personal information. And having read the full report, there is places in the document where it, it provides pen pictures, which relate very specifically to personal details of the officers. So largely, the redaction is around the personal details. It is a very um, transparent document because it will show specifically where those redactions are made. And quite simply, they're blacked out um, and, and covered over. So it will be very, very apparent where we've redacted some personal information from that document. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Mr Sarsi, I wanted you to just come back um, to you and ask a very brief additional question to the answer um, th that you gave me when asked about the new arrangements and how successful you thought the new arrangements would be and would they solve all the, the previous deficiencies that had been highlighted. And you, you said that there were media issues, issues from years ago that still had to be resolved. Why, <coughs> why is that? There's, there's issues issues that are um, playing out in the media just now actually relate to practices mm -hmm. that took place took place years ago, and that's actually part of the crux of the matter, and that's part of the Northumbria inquiry, and it's part of the Durham inquiry, and the longer these things drag on, it's, it's got a massive impact on public confidence, mm -hmm. but it's also importantly got a massive impact on individual officers. We've got officers that have now been under scrutiny for an extraordinary length, length of time. We've heard from uh, Mr mm -hmm. Spears that impa that's impacted on their careers because they've been unable to progress their careers in, in certain ways because of certain restrictions or protections. And we absolutely support the, these protections and restrictions, but to me it's unacceptable that um, in this day and age, given public confidence and given individual mm -hmm. officers, these matters take so long. So are, are you confident that the new arrangements will resolve complaints quickly? I understand um, that there's been far less of any complaints that have come in over, over, the, last, over the last two years. Um, Mr Spears has already spoken about one of his intentions is for a swift response. We would push him on, we, we continue to push him on that and, and, and we'd ask, ask about that. I understand some of, the, some of the detail of why it's taken so long, why we went to Durham Inquiry, but I mean, our, our position is it's either service delivery, it's a conduct matter, or it's a, it's a criminal matter. And actually, I think some of the practices that have taken place or some inquiries have potentially and really prolonged matters here. Mm. Be because when you say that you want matters dealt with um, s swiftly, Clearly, you want matters dealt with as quickly as possible for the, for the benefit of the person um, that's made the complaint, for Absolutely. the benefit of the person that's being complained about. But it, it would make sense to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you set some kind of time scale within the, 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 the new guidelines and arrangements that you have to say by such and such a date something must be dealt with, three months down the line something must be dealt with, to at least give people some confidence that there is some time frame around what, what they're going into? That would be very helpful, even even accepting there may be some times where, for very good reason, these, these parameters wouldn't, wouldn't be kept, but that would be very helpful. OK. Ben. Thank you, Convener. Uh, touching on to similar uh, themes that the Convener just raised, and uh, good afternoon all, and uh, Mr Sutty, you, you, you touched on this in your, your <laughs> opening remarks and also in your answer there with uh, referencing the 
the points made by the SPF in their written submission about uh, their statement that we regret, however, that the apparent willingness to frustrate the remedy for officers who were wronged in the past will forever see the new ACU as an untrusted corner of the police service, just like its predecessor, the CCU. Um, I, I, do you recognise the concerns raised by the SPF um, about this lack of confidence, or yes. are, are they being over-exaggerated? No, I, I, I recognise the, the, the concerns that they're making. I think a lot of the concerns, and I think the Federation themselves, accept a lot of the, a lot of the change that have taken place are welcomed. I think they said they, they broadly welcomed the change. So I suppose my frustration is let's start looking forward rather than looking backward. But it's absolutely necessary for the complainers and for public confidence and for officers concerned we we'll come to a resolution for these matters and once and for all we can say they, they've been dealt with, the learning's been taken and we, and we move on. I, I share your... your ambition to, to look forward um, as much as possible and, and be constructive and in, in that frame I mean how do how do we get past this because obviously as you've already raised public confidence and trust within uh, in terms of officers trust in, 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 any, in a, any system is absolutely paramount to anti-corruption measures so how do we how do we get past this I, I'm hoping the solution that uh, that Mr Spears mentioned earlier that um, the Durham report, the um, Northumbria report, other matters which have been which have been raised, you know, in, internally will all be addressed in one document and that document will be brought forward and uh, to yourselves and to others to give you some confidence that we're actually dealing with that seriously. And then the proof of the pudding will be in eating as we go forward, changing that culture and ensuring in future things are dealt with far more swiftly than they have been in the past. And robustly, there's, if, if there, corruption is a very insidious thing, we've got a duty to respect, to, to protect the service and, and the public from people who will, who will corrupt officers or, or be corrupt. They need to be weeded out quickly and out of the service, and that's everyone's ambition. And, and, and in terms of the public confidence, as you, you spoke of, obviously, we, the, the way the media reports uh, matters and is, is out with our control, quite rightly. But in terms of once we get past... The, the, the current challenges, will Police Scotland be engaged in, in making sure that they do all that they can through a public relations perspective or any other mechanisms to make sure that uh, yeah. that public confidence is, is increased and preserved? I would hope so. That's probably one better for Mr Spears to answer, yeah. I yeah. suggest. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would like to offer a couple of comments. You'll be aware from the HMICS review that, that made 39 recommendations. Those recommendations, if we were picking the themes from them, were about strategic oversight about governance, about how we manage intelligence and how we look at processes. What I can give the committee an assurance of today is that I meet with the head of um, anti-corruption unit three times a week, have a really clear oversight about the work they undertake, and then I report to the Deputy Chief Constable on a weekly basis. But importantly, sitting underneath that, I spoke earlier about the assessment unit, and that's really, really important because I think there has been instances in the past where pieces of work have crept into the counter-corruption unit, which might be not about corruption, they're behavioural. The, the processes we now have in place um, are very much about ensuring that the anti-corruption unit focus on the business that they should focus on. And, I, and I'm confident that the changes we've made will allow us to do that. I completely agree with Mr, Mr. Sutty in, in terms of some of the, the historical cases and maybe the reporting that still exists in the media. And perhaps a bit of time is needed just to, to grow the confidence in the system. We've introduced a new online integrity matters reporting system. It's a very audible, tra um, transparent system that allows me on a daily basis to see the demand of business that's flowing in. So I, I have a real confidence that we have a real grip, perhaps far greater than we've ever had on anti-corruption business. I, I welcome that. And I think that the, the Raising the, the, the integrity matters system is, is important, and, and that word integrity is so important. I just think of communities I represent where um, organised crime has, a, has, has a, 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 an unhelpful and negative effect on community coherence yeah. and also confidence in, in, in the criminal justice system, and how we tackle a, a robust anti corruption measure within our police service, but also a sense that in the public domain that anti-corruption is an absolute priority and for, for Police Scotland is so important. So um, if I can collaborate on that going forward from a constituent perspective, then I'd be keen oh, to engage. And I think, I think Mr. McPherson, it's, it's important to recognise that it's a really, really small fraction of, of, of professional standards Indeed. business which sits within, within the anti-corruption unit. So we have a very, very small minority of matters that, that we're considering on a weekly or monthly basis. I, I, I note and recognise that. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay. Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, I'm interested to know why the officers, um, the subject or the subject of the proceedings, have not been able to see a full version of the Durham report. Can you clarify? Have they seen a redacted version since it concluded in May? The, the, the officers or complainers, um, including the ex-officers, have, have, have been invited in recent weeks to, to see the redacted version of the report. Um, in, in simple terms, I, I say redacted because at this point in time there's quite a considerable level of p very personal detail contained within the Durham report, and I think that that is entirely um, inappropriate to show those those officers. I, again, in answer to Mr Finney, the document is very transparent and it is very clear to see from the redacted version of the report um, where um, those redactions have been made. I think it's also really important to highlight um, that in terms of those complainers, they received very detailed letters providing them with a very detailed update against every allegation they made. So, Having looked at those letters prior to them being sent to the, the officers, they ran into 18, 19 and 20 pages. So they've had a very detailed explanation around um, the complaints that they raised. And they were also presented with the opportunity, should they wish to take that, to, to refer matters to PERC if they were dissatisfied with the manner in which the complaint has been handled. So whilst a period of six months has passed, there has considerable things been happening uh, in the background to that their opportunity to, to, to talk to PERC, their opportunity to, to digest very, very detailed and comprehensive letters, and now the opportunity in more recent times to, to see the redacted document. And will they ever be able to see the full unredacted version of it? I think it's very difficult to do that simply because of the, per the level of personal detail that's, that's contained within that. So, and, and sorry, can I just start with that? When you're saying personal detail, you mean personal details about other people? Because if it's a Yes. I'm a bit confused yes. as to why so, it's personal. So in, in really simple, ap apologies, in really uh, simple terms, it can, um, included in that document would be a pen picture of the seven officers who are con just now subject of a misconduct inquiry. That, that information itself would be entirely inappropriate to share when it goes into very, very fine detail around those officers' details, their ages, their, their, their postings, the whole raft of details. So um, it, it's detail like that. In, in no shape or form, having reviewed the redacted version, do I think mm -hmm. they're going to see a document which would fall short of what they would expect to see. I think it, mm -hmm. the document flows, and I think it would provide significant answers to many of the questions that people would have. I'm, I'm still a bit unclear as to why that amount of personal detail would go into a report. You know, surely it should just be the nature of the complaints, etc. It's, it's a really good question. And being really honest with you, it's Durham style of, of how they've written the report. I think when we ask them to do an investigation and provide us with a report, we accept the report in the format that they would give us it in. I've gave them certainly a lot of guidance in terms of the normal approach that we would have anticipated in Police Scotland. But I'm working with the report that, that Durham submitted to us. OK, thank you. Stuart. Um, just a very small point. I think most of the things I might have asked have been covered. Um, have IPT, the uh, Investigatory Powers Tribunal, got any continuing role in this? Or do they continue to work with uh, uh, those who have been in contact with us? IPT would always sit in, in the background, Mr Stevenson. So what we have done in more recent times is provided them with a comprehensive update of exactly where matters are. I think they would want to see this drawn to a, a conclusion, which would conclude with the investigation completely finished and that document published. So we, ha we, we do, from time to time, keep a contact with the IPT in terms of the progress of, of that inquiry. So would it be your intention then at the conclusion of this process to cross-check with IPT that you've discharged all the responsibilities they think you should have discharged in this regard? Absolutely, and we would do that through our legal services team who, who would also engage directly and get an absolute confidence that we've done all the, all the things that we'd expect of us. Convener, thank you. Liam. Good afternoon. Um, if I could maybe take us back to, to where the convener um, brought us in earlier on, Mr Livingston. Uh, I think in your evidence <coughs> you pointed to a concern around um, the, the, the lack of independent 
scrutiny um, with the knowledge and indeed the, the, uh, the, the, the powers and the ability to adjudicate within the, the system where, where issues spanned um, operational matters and, and employment law. It'd be helpful if you, if you could just perhaps spell out in a little more detail the basis for those concerns and then perhaps go on to say whether or not those concerns persist. Yeah, uh, certainly the, the previous situation was that we had or encountered situations where <coughs> excuse me, some of the activities of the CCU at that time uh, didn't really acknowledge um, the kind of employment rights um, that members of police staff were entitled to. Um, since then, we have seen radical improvement in that area. But at, at the same time, it would be amiss not to kind of acknowledge the fact that where um, there is a focus on perhaps behaviours of police staff and bearing in mind the kind of human rights implications that, um, if I could just have a look, um, the interference with those rights by a public body shall be justified where it is in accordance with the law and necessary for, among other things, public safety, then sometimes there can be a bit of a blurring of the lines between the behaviours of that individual and also how um, the force takes measures um, in order to kind of intervene in these circumstances. Now, it's very reassuring to hear Mr Spears speak about how there's a move away from punitive measures. Um, but I think in the main, um, there's still an existence that, that, that would oversimplify things and focus on <coughs> those behaviours. Um, I think we have to bear in mind the, the fact that... Um, sorry, I've, I've lost my train. Um, that there's enough integrity there that the organisation... <coughs> doesn't have a sole responsibility to examine where these breaches have taken place. I think policing over the last four years has had some really difficult challenges to contend with. Um, and some of the targets which have been kind of imposed upon policing leaders have brought about some rather uncompromising situations with regards to how they balance well-being with how they actually deal with members, the, the staff bodies and entities of the organisation, such as cuts to police staff, and how the workload amongst police staff has been spread. And so how we actually see the organisation treating its people has led to some compromising and ethical challenges. So, do, so would it be fair to say that you are still of the view that the underpinning legislation needs to provide um, uh, a fully independent process for complaints and for, <coughs> for whistleblowing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you consider some of the provisions which exist, particularly in England and Wales, and the role of the IPCC, um, I think there was a, a situation which I think it was in relation to PC James Patrick down in England and Wales, uh, the Metropolitan Police, and there were certain provisions which were redrafted within Home Office guidelines governing... Um, police regulations, and that forced them to actually look at that to the extent where they actually go over and above what's provided by law and legislation. Um, if we could go back to, say, for instance, the Code of Conduct for police staff and police officers, at the time that that was drafted, one of the attractive things within the provisions of that was the fact that it actually made mention of whistleblowing. Um, which offered us some, some form of reassurance. And at the time, there was no whistleblowing policy within the, the organisation. Mm. We've since seen a move where the Scottish Government um, uh, police sponsor team have actually taken a step back from mm. that because they feel that the law doesn't necessarily allow them to intervene because they're not an employer and they're not a named body under the provisions of PIDA. So, mm. y you know, there's some inconsistencies there um, and some inconsistencies north of the border that we would like to see addressed. I, I'm keen to bring in particularly Mr Spears, but others as well. But just before I do that, I, another element of the concern that you were mm. pointing to, perhaps a, a sort of aggravating um, factor was what you described as a dysfunctional relationship between Police Scotland, SPA and, and Scottish Government. Yeah. Uh, it, again, it would be helpful to know whether um, you think that remains the case, what the basis of the concern, um, concern I, I, was. I mean, I certainly think it's a work in progress. I think with all this kind of um, area of development, it's there's learning to, to be had there and, and certainly... Uh, 
all bodies involved in policing in Scotland are certainly striving to try and achieve greater standards. But at the same time, I, I think um, some of the, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, Dr Ali Malik's study certainly pointed to some concerns and quite serious concerns about the ability of the SPA to, to challenge Police Scotland on some of those things. Um, and so the relationships there uh, is whether we, are, we have confidence in people to actually challenge where there is a perception of wrongdoing within the service. So, uh, so the view is that um, complaints were, or, or whistleblowing was not taking place because there was a lack of confidence within the I believe so, yes. System. Right. Uh, Mr Spears, yeah, yeah, thank you. I, th I think Mr Livingston is, uh, is also touching on <coughs> potential proportionality and consistency. Yeah. And I think for me that is really important. And it's one of my really early considerations in every instance. Is, is our response proportionate and is it consistent? And, and I think that's where the assessment unit is really, really helpful. Because there is a lot of matters that will come into uh, that unit which quite simply can be pushed back to HR colleagues or can be dealt with at a much lower level. I think um, it's been a step forward to see us in June this year introducing a whistleblowing policy for the force. I think the confidence internally within the organisation to report matters is improving quite significantly. And I say that from the perspective of I'm seeing those reports and I'm actually seeing less reports that are anonymous and more reports where officers are prepared to speak out and, if you like, put their name to, to, to the statements they're making. So I think that there's a build, a building of confidence within the organisation to report wrongdoing at every level. Um, I, I think we need more time um, to, to allow that to roll out. But I think it's important that the whistleblowing policy just outlines a range of, of mechanisms that all, our officers and, and staff can, can, can use. I, on a weekly basis, monitor um, whistleblowing integrity matters and report that to our executives. So I am confident of that that picture is changing, but I'm also very, very confident that we are adopting a much more proportionate and consistent approach to everything we deal with. And, and the point that Mr Livingston was making around the, the, the independence, I suppose, drawing on some of the experience um, elsewhere in the UK, is that something that can be captured within the current, the I, current framework? I think it can, and I'll be really honest with you, I'm challenged on a, a daily basis from colleagues from all the staff associations <coughs> I'm, I'm challenged at times from some of the force solicitors. So I think as an organisation, and particularly in the PSD environment, we have come enough, became an awful lot stronger in how we deal with matters. I am very frequently challenged around independence, and that's why, from a national perspective, I will very, very frequently look with um, the Deputy Chief Constable at who is the most appropriate person to consider a matter, and very often we will use individuals and groups um, of people from all parts of the country. Um, and I think that brings a, a, an element of independence to, to that. And again, to the, the point Mr Livingston make, challenge coming from the SPA as well. I mean, what, what's, what's been the role of, of SPA and how's that evolved over the last number of months? I think that has improved significantly, Mr MacArthur. I think uh, it re required improvement, which was why we uh, commissioned, or not commissioned, but requested HMICS uh, carry out the review, which we've acted upon. But I think that in uh, recent times, uh, chairing the uh, CCU reference group uh, for these policies and processes and procedures to be tested and challenged and implemented, and then the follow-through uh, via the policing committee, and the fact that you know complaints uh, about officers within, uh, for example, the anti-corruption uh, unit, automatically get referred to uh, the SPA uh, is, is a good thing, so that we can take action and constantly review. The policing committee is fairly new, so I, I think you know that that will be a good uh, a, a good vehicle to uh, to use uh, for these things. In addition to that, uh, we uh, published the whistleblowing uh, revised whistleblowing policy. Uh, in uh, May. Um, and again, that was a collaborative product between ourselves and Police Scotland, so they're very reflective. Um, and it gives us the opportunity uh, to, again, uh, have regular reports and challenge on that, uh, which is slightly different, but associated. And uh, fully understand uh, uh, Drew uh, Livingston's position in relation to um, matters being raised um, with the authority and not quite being dealt with promptly enough, and I think that these new policies and processes will assist with that. But also we've introduced um, 
more regular meetings uh, with uh, our colleagues in the trade unions and staff associations, so quarterly meetings, uh, but twice a year we will have uh, strategic meetings where everybody comes into the room. And at that point, I think that, that presents another opportunity uh, for the uh, staff associations and trade unions to actually apply scrutiny to the authority. So it works the other way. Um, and that will then bring these things to the surface if we're not uh, dealing with matters as appropriately as we've set out. And if that is the case, then I'm pretty sure um, that the staff associations and trade unions would be making you aware of that at future meetings. Mm -hmm. Is, this, is, that, is, is, is your experience of holding feet to the fire the same, is it? I don't know if we hold feet to the fire, but I've been, I've been reassured by Mr Livingston coming along <laughs> and talking about the, the reporting to authority. And I think there's a far better culture within the organisation just now with people willing to stand up and, and, and report upwards. I think that's good. I think the integrity matters is helpful. I think the measures put in place, and I sat on one of the SPA groups looking at how, how matters would be resolved. And I think the reporting up of matters to the SPA is helpful. The meetings with the SPA is helpful. I think you started off the fundamental question about change in legislation, and there still is an issue going back to the 2006 Act as the interpretation of what is a, a matter of employment or service and whether that can be reported to the PERC or not. I would have actually thought some of these big issues, corruption issues, wouldn't be a matter of employment or service, it would be a matter of concerns. And my expectation is that the PERC should be in a position to actually pick up on some, to pick up on some of these if they're, if they're not happy. But that's, that's not a matter for us, that, that's a matter of process. I'd be reassured if the processes that the, the service are put in place, these issues shouldn't arise. And I'm far more confident these issues won't arise in the future, but there does have to be consideration if they did arise, how people could resolve things. And I think a lot of the measures have been put in place would probably preclude the need for legislation, but that's, that's not a matter for me just now to, to push forward. Is that something that, uh, well, who is it a, a matter for? Is it, do you think it's a matter for, for, for Parliament to satisfy itself that the, the intention around legislation is... is uh, is satisfied? I mean, have you, is this something that's been has been probed and, and, and rebuffed, or what? No. If if it, if it was a matter for, for our um, association that we thought there was need for a change in legislation, we would through lobbying, you know, put, put that yeah. forward. We we don't we don't see that as being the case just now. And the measures that have been put in place have given us far greater confidence now than ever before that actually that that need won't arise. John, did you want to come in yeah. for another question? Um, it's, it's a question for Mr Spears and Mr Foley, and it's about the, the term that's been used a few times now, and that's proportionality. Um, I, I asked about suspension, uh, Mr Spears, and in relation particularly to the issue of the illegitimate acquisition of 32 days of communications data. Can, can I say, and, and this is a quote, what the victim of that, who was paid £10,000 compensation, uh, said that they'd suffered. They'd suffered an invasion of privacy, familial strife, personal stress and strain and loss of long-standing friendships. Um, there's a perception reinforced by the situation of a chief constable who's the subject of a number of complaints who's on gardening leave that suspension is more rigorously applied to the federated ranks, to junior officers than it is to senior officers. How would you address that? I think from my perspective, um, my priority is looking at officers from the rank of chief superintendent to constable. I think the, the application of suspension is something we take very seriously and it is very carefully considered and, and balanced at times against the welfare of that officer and their families. So it is something we take very, very seriously. We do see the option um, to apply restrictions on duties or mod modified duties as a an alternative to suspension. Um, I think it's something, particularly with serious matters, that we will always give um, serious consideration to. I think your, your second part of the question is clearly a matter for, for Mr indeed. Foley, and, and I would leave that with him to answer. Yeah. Well, well if, I, if I could follow up on that, um, there are no one, at least of all me, wants to see police officers doing anything other than engaged in police work, and certainly not suspended from, or anyone not to be able to go to their work. Is it something that any of these inquiries are going to pick up as the, the, the response of Police Scotland to what are serious accusations? And because of the, the fact that we don't have reports, this is simply going to trundle on. And there are issues of public confidence that are essential in here. I don't doubt the good work that's going on, and I'm sure that everyone's engaged in good faith. But this has happened. It's very public. Do you understand any of these forces will look at the proportionality of Police Scotland's response to these accusations? I'm pretty confident that's already <coughs> captured in elements of the Durham report. I'm also very confident that we What did Durham say about suspension at all, then, Mr Spears? 
well, I'm, I'm not in, in this instance when we have a number of officers restricted and subject to mis gross misconduct investigations just now. It would be entirely inappropriate for me to comment on the detailed content of that report. I think what you also have to recognise is the piece of work that Durham done was incredibly complex. Um, very often, a matter of suspension can be incredibly straightforward. This, this whole event or series of events were incredibly complex, involving a whole range of officers, and I suspect will bring from it organisational learning. So I think it's really important that we do take the learning from the Durham report, but we await the outcome of the PSNI investigation. And what's the difference between misconduct and gross misconduct when it comes to uh, legislation, please? It's all contained within the, the, our conduct um, regulations from 2014 for the Police Service of Scotland. And what are they called, please, uh, Mr Spears? Police Conduct um, Scotland Regulations 2014. The, the simple difference is about severity in terms of the, the actions of the officers. So misconduct, um, we would, the, the regulations would, would allow us to refer that matter back to the local policing division for a misconduct meeting where they consider the most appropriate course of disposal up to the point of a final writing warning. When you look at gross misconduct, you're considering the dismissal from the police service as, a, as an option. But not suspension, clearly, in this instance. Suspension, suspension is a consideration in every instance, um, Mr Finney, but I think the point I'm trying to make with the, with the Durham investigation, this was incredibly complex and, and, and certainly wasn't a black and white issue. And whilst it was considered, it was deemed at the time that, um, that put in place a number of restrictions was a more appropriate um, out outcome. And if, if you recall, Durham's initial work was around a complaint inquiry rather than a misconduct investigation. So at the point of receiving Durham's final report in May, we then took measures um, around the officers involved in, in that report and are now allowing PSNI to follow through with the misconduct investigation. I'm really trying to understand because it, it could be perceived in layman's terms that th these have been corrupt <coughs> practices that have been alleged. The fact that these are practices in a unit called the anti-corruption unit, you would imagine, does compound the, the severity with which they'd be looked at. But I, I accept a position on the, the, the suspension. Mr Foley, on the question of proportionality and junior officers suspended for what is perceived to be uh, less serious issues, and a chief constable, the subject of serious accusations on gardening leave. It doesn't seem to be an option that's made available to federated ranks. Uh, well, the, uh, the situation in senior uh, officer ranks is that the police authority uh, takes those decisions for senior officers only, um, and the board makes, uh, takes full consideration uh, of all the facts, including complaints, and they uh, make a determination as to whether uh, that uh, warrants an action, and that action uh, you know, could be to uh, place an officer uh, on, on leave um, if they request that, uh, or it could be suspension. Uh, suspension is also uh, a consideration in matters and uh, in relation to the Chief Constable uh, currently uh, the decision to uh, continue or not with uh, a period of leave is reviewed every four weeks uh, by the Board. And how much annual leave does a Chief Constable get, Mr Foley? Uh, from recollection I, I think it's roughly about 42 days, 45 days, Mr Foley, around about that. And, and who's made that decision in relation to the Chief Constable, please? The Board. The board. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Mr Thank Foley, can I, can I just ask you what steps the um, Scottish Police Authority take to ensure the independence of an, an officer that's appointed to carry out an inquiry? Uh, in respect of uh, an inquiry by perhaps in, uh, Durham? Yeah. Uh -huh. or, or, uh, in, in respect of a complaint um, and an officer is appointed to carry out an inquiry, how do you ensure that that officer is independent? Well, uh, uh, if we're talking about complaints against senior officers, which mm -hmm. is what, what we deal with, yeah. uh, the process would be that the complaint uh, uh, comes into... We have a small complaint section uh, of, of three people, uh, and it's their sole uh, job. That's what they do all the time, is to assess uh, uh, the complaints and report. Uh, they would then uh, sit down with me in relation to those complaints, and uh, we would have a legal representative as well and a board member, uh, and the decision uh, would then be taken... Uh, whether to refer uh, the matter to the PERC um, if it was uh, deemed to be uh, misconduct 
or gross misconduct, or uh, if we deemed that no action, uh, further action was taken, uh, then that's another option that we have. Okay. Yeah. Can, uh, convener, could, could I just uh, come in with something? I'm conscious nobody has uh, raised the fact that there is a second uh, Durham report because the uh, the Durham report that we've been referring to uh, and addressing to Mr Spears uh, clearly relates to the officers uh, in the unit who weren't senior officers. As part of the overall allegations, that touched on uh, some of the senior officers as well. And so there's, there is a report, we have a report which relates to senior officers, but in that report there is no uh, evidence or suggestion that there is any uh, grounds for instituting misconduct actions or um, any uh, criminality. Okay, John. Yeah, thank you. Well, that, that's very interesting, Mr. Foley. Will you make that report available to the committee, please? In the, in the same way that that, uh, that Mr. Spears will, we will do the same thing at the same time, Mr. Finney. Well, it, it would seem we're going to have to wait several months to. Um, well, um, well, um, well, if you have that report already and you've already determined the outcome, could you make it available to the committee? We, we will please? make that available to the committee. We'll, we'll have to go through the action process, but you will have it before Christmas. Okay, thank you very yeah. much indeed. I just have a, a couple of um, final questions um, for Chief Superintendent Spears, and I don't think any other members have any further questions, um, do they? C can I just ask you, um, Chief Superintendent, who made the decision to progress the conduct investigation? And did whoever made that decision, if you can tell us, did they take into account the, the delay it would take in time and the impact it would have on the officers? The decision, the decision to, to progress that matter was taken by the Deputy Chief Constable. Um, we always would think about the well-being and welfare around officers, but recognise that it was really important that, based on the information contained within the Durham report, that we had to progress matters matters in this way. Um, so we were very, very conscious of that. We have always been very conscious that when we ask an external force to conduct a piece of work for us, we at times are dependent on the timescales in which they can do that. My priority is to make sure they access as much information, as, as much detail, as efficiently as they possibly can, in the hope that that inquiry can be concluded in a really timeless fashion. So I recognise the challenges. We continually look at the welfare impact on all officers. So on a monthly basis, um, I would sit down with the Deputy Chief Constable and review every suspension and restriction and look at some of the restricted officers just to look at the, the timescales around that. So we are very alive to the, the negative impact of, of those decisions. And were the officers involved kept up to date on, on every development as, as it took place? We, Specifically in relation to the timescales, the, the delays? Have they been kept up to date and informed? In relation to the, the complainers? Yes. Or, yes, yes. And, and, and to be fair, um, Durham developed a, a, a very sound relationship with those officers. It was really important that our role in this was, or my team's role in this was to facilitate the work that Durham were, were doing, but I was very conscious that they were engaging on a regular basis with the complainers on behalf of Police Scotland. OK, that's helpful. And, and my final question, um, when my colleague Rona Mackay um, asked you a question about the, the reports and the redacted reports, and you said that the redacted reports would not fall short of the detail that people wanted, is, wh whose opinion is that? Well, I, I guess it's I guess it's a subjective opinion that we and within the force we would take. I think what the point I was trying to convey was we are not taking a report and we're turning it into something else. We're taking a report and we're simply taking out very personal details. So anyone picking up the report can read the sentence that maybe misses out the name Alan Spears. So we've kept it as. I think it's a very, it's very realistic and it's very close um, to to the report. So, in, in no shape or form, does this bear any difference to the actual report that, that Durham produced? So, what I was trying to just to point out to you is that that's a really clear report with simple areas taken out within that report, and it's very obvious where those redactions are taking place. Okay. Um, thank you. As, as there are no further um, questions from um, <coughs> members, can I thank all of our witnesses for coming um, along today and providing us with um, some very useful information. I'm sure it's a subject that we will be returning to. Um, we now move into private session and I'll suspend briefly to allow witnesses to clear. Thank you. <laughs>